Thanks, Miguel. Okay. So let's keep going. Um, at some point, remember, but I believe there are no more questions. So. <laughs> now it should just be all about directly the code. So, first of all, any questions? Any, any, anything that anybody wants to say or that we should talk about? Okay. So now let's turn to what's actually inside QMC Pack. So the philosophy of the design that we're going is basically to have only the core algorithm in FQMC. So generation, the, the FQMC code essentially would have as input the matrices that define the Hamiltonian, so the one and the two body electron integrals and the wave function, nothing else. The code doesn't know about atomic positions, doesn't know which basis it is, doesn't know what sort of potential. All of that happens in some mean field code. The mean field code generates these three matrices essentially, and that's all that AFMC needs. The reason we did this, of course, it puts a lot more pressure on having good mean field codes that can do this, but that's that's the point. They are optimized for doing that efficiently. And we optimize for doing the FKMC efficiently. It would be way too much work to try to do both. So that's a strength and a weakness because it also means that it takes a certain amount of time to ramp up enough production level mean field codes so that the workflow is smooth. Right now we're limited to a handful of codes, but the whole point is that hopefully a few years from now we can use a variety of codes and, and essentially you get to pick and choose. Um, so the first thing is that the code is still under very, very active development. Essentially, we have a lot of things that we want to keep doing. I'm going to put that list at the end. And basically, we are code monkeys at this point. And so every three to six months, we have a batch, a new batch of, of features that we upload to the, to the development version. So you should always check the developer's version. And if you are in any sort of doubt, contact uh, us in Livermore, and we can tell you what's happening and where things should be coming up. Uh, in terms of mean field codes, it's mainly the same list that Paul just mentioned, but with a few exceptions. Uh, MOPRO, for example, can be used to generate input for auxiliary field, and we are working on uh, a prototype FASP interface that should allow us to essentially do directly FASP calculations and, and generate the integrals and everything that's needed. Um, the reason why MOPRO works is, is not that there is a particular interface to FKMC, it's more that uh, the or originally when we started doing this, we, we were working on top of the ASCII-based full CI dump format of MOPRO, which was essentially what everybody was using in, in orbital space, the full CI KMC people and, and everybody else. So we adopted that same uh, file structure. So anything that can generate the full CI dump essentially would be possible, would be usable as a generation code for, for FKMC. We used to natively read the FKMC code in ASCII. Uh, we realized how terribly inefficient that is. So we literally got rid of it from the code. Now, you, if you want to use the, the ASCII full CI dump, you have to go through a, bias, uh, through a Python script that generates HDF information for us. Just, I mean, if reading 20 gigabytes in ASCII takes half an hour. So that is not a good idea. But. <coughs> So um, the focus is mainly on efficiency and on big systems. We really wanted to test the waters in terms of how big of a system could we do and, and really design the code to be on that frontier. So if you're running very small systems, systems with just a handful of basic functions and a handful of electrons, the code is still going to perform well, but it's really not optimized for those. It's optimized for reaching you know, the 100 atom type of system. And so the input is, is the same input as QMC pack, it's XML based. Uh, the, all the data from now on is going to be HDF. We, we still read wave functions in ASCII for historical purposes, but as of next version, that's going to completely go away. You don't need to know about it because the Python tools just generate the files for you, so you don't even need to look at them. But essentially, we're going to be an HDF data only, and the, the analysis is mainly based on Python right now. So, Miguel, one question. So yes. when you said that ion, ionic positions are not path through, so basically even when you do forces, the derivatives are provided by the x mean field code. Yeah, you have to read in the gradients of the matrix elements. Yeah. Because the force is actually an, it, it's just a contraction of the Green's function with, with some tensor, right? It doesn't even know that it's calculating forces, essentially. It's your job to know that that's actually a force. Well, I will see huge uh, files, probably. <laughs> 
So, so we haven't really worked that courses yet because of this. It's, it's sort of the next step. So the workflow is pretty simple. There's still things that are under development, mainly because we're growing up so quickly. But essentially, it's, it's a similar workflow to real space. You, you have to run. Right now, this is mainly for PyCF because it's a code that we use for solid state calculations. But you know, switch that for whatever your mean field code is. You're going to do some sort of mean field calculation that's going to generate its own checkpoint, for example, its own solution. Then you have to run some converter tool that's going to translate their out their output into what we read in FMC. And it's typically just a one line Python call and it should be pretty quick. Then you just run FKMC. I'm going to go into details about the, the input and you run QMCA to post process the data file. So this mainly has small quantities like energies and things like this. And if you want to calculate charge densities or anything that's more expensive, then we save that through HDF and you have to post process it through Python. Right now the um, the main problem, not the main problem, the, the main limitation I would say is that we have a certain number of properties that we have looked at. So we have Python scripts on how to build those out of the KMC pack output. But um, so if you have a completely new property that we haven't done, then, then we, we might have to, to work a little bit about getting uh, essentially the post processing script. But uh, once you do it once, it's, it can be redone and it's pretty generic how you do this for generic systems. But right now it's more on a case by case basis. So it doesn't, it's not clear right here. You might have to look at it in your slides. But this is a, a sample input file for AFKMC. There are two different types of XML blocks. There are execution blocks that are actually called execute. They will be in the next slide. And then there's everything else. So everything else defines some sort of input that goes into an execution block. Um, you have uh, the, the, the first thing is that. The, the, the input is parsed twice. On the first parse, anything that's not an execute block gets read. And on the second pass, the execution blocks are read and executed sequentially, essentially. So you can make fairly complicated workflows if you want. I would suggest doing that at an expert level. For now, let's just focus on doing single day FKMC calculations per input file. But essentially, you can define an arbitrary number of these and do them all in, in the same input. So there is a what I call an information block. And the main reason is because I don't want to repeat this all over. Um, I should say very soon this is going to go away, but right now as it is, you still need to specify the number of molecular orbitals and the number of electrons in the up and in the down channels. It has a sort of a weird name. It's called number of active electrons alpha and beta. So I, I apologize for the weird name, but this goes back to quotes that I started writing maybe 10 years ago. But essentially, you have to specify the number of orbitals, the number of up, and the number of down. And then you have to, every XML block has to be named because you're going to use that name to refer to it later on. So every block needs to have an information block because everybody needs to know essentially what are the, the, set, the settings of the calculation, how many electrons and how many orbitals you have. So, Miguel, sorry, so does it mean that the, the, the information about the number of orbitals that you have is not stored somewhere where the tables are generated? It is stored. It is in this file, and we're going to get rid of it. The reason I put it in, uh, I just wanted to have certainty that you were thinking about it when you wrote the input file. So it's you okay. have to run a cast, right? So, so that's true. So, in principle, you can change this, right? You can generate an input file, and then you can just say, "Give me a different number of electrons." So, if you do that, you you have to do it this way. But in principle, what would happen is just that you would read the scene and you would just check that that the numbers are compatible. Okay, so, can you? Th th this is my question. Was let's say you misspell something and you put two fifty-five. So, is this gonna die and telling you, "Hey, you're not using the same"? Right now, it dies. Right now, it says this is. I, I assume that this is a mistake. So we, we this can be changed. For now, I kind of assume uh, that, that you have to put consistent things just to, to be. Ideally, the way we would do this is that if you want to change this, you change it when you change it when you generate the file so that everything is consistent. As of the next version, we're getting rid of this because this was there mainly for safety purposes. We're gonna start trusting. The users and if things are called run, then I guess it's your fault. So, but it simplifies things, you know. So my second question is: Is this file automatically generated to no, by CF? Or this yet. is written by hand. This is written by hand right now. Yeah, we're not yet at that level of automatization, but but this is it. I mean, so yeah. just you know. The other thing is that we have a Hamiltonian, a wave function, a walker, and a propagator. The four essential pieces to auxiliary field. As you see, 
mainly all of them can send all the defaults. There are going to be a lot of options, and you can look at the options in the documentation and in the examples. I'm not going to go into so much detail the options, but mostly the defaults work. So if you want to do a generic auxiliary flow calculation, your input file can be pretty empty. You, you need the most important thing. You need essentially the file containing the integrals and the information from the mean flow calculation, and that's going to define your Hamiltonian. Then you are going to need the wave function, and so the Essentially, right now, uh, the wave function is being dumped to a file in ASCII and it's being read back. Uh, we already have the, the tools to essentially put the wave function also on this file. So very soon, although not right now, I would uh, you know go back to, to whenever you, if you decide to start using it, talk to us or look at the documentation. That in the near future, essentially, you won't need to specify a file in here. It's going to assume whatever file you specify up here. You do need to specify a type because there are two main types of wave functions. In general, all the wave functions are assumed to be multi-determinant, and if you have one determinant, then, then that, that, that'll be it, but it's the same code. It's the difference between whether the orbitals are orthogonal or non-orthogonal in that expansion, and I'll come back to that. So the, the, the default wave function, which is the MSD wave function, does not assume any symmetry or anything between determinants. You just, you give it n determinants, it's gonna go sequentially, and it's gonna do each one of the n. So it's linear cost on the number of terms. The particle hole MSD, which is PH MSD, it's, it's essentially my bad name for the CI language function where you have a reference and expectations with respect to that reference. And for that, we have uh, optimized, you know, Sherman Morrison like fast updates that give you, you can do, you know, hundreds of thousands, maybe millions of determinants if you want. And here, you typically just need to specify a file name. Um, but again, in the future, it's just going to be the same HDF. This file is generated by the <coughs> tools, so you don't even need to look at it. For now, it just, con just contains a wave function. The Walker set, um, essentially, you, you just you need a name, and you need to define what type of a Walker you want. Right now, there are two valid choices, which is close and collinear. So close means that the alpha and the beta states are assumed to be the same. So you actually don't store a beta determinant. You only have determinants for spin up, and any time a calculation is needed, and you need a determinant for down, it just takes the up twice, essentially. So doubly occupied walkers, essentially the correct choice for singlet states. And then you have closed, uh, sorry, collinear, which is the default. If you don't put anything, it's gonna do a collinear calculation where you assume that the number of up and the number of down is fixed through the calculation, but each one can have its own, essentially, Slater matrix. Uh, we're working on non-collinear, and that should be functional within some number of months, and in that case, each electron is going to have an alpha and a beta component, and you're going to have one matrix that encapsulates all spin electrons of, of both spins. Essentially. So you go to the case where the number of up and the number of down is not well defined, it's something that can vary through the calculation. Finally, there is a propagator. So many of these things exist because each time the code goes through this, it creates the appropriate class. So they, they must exist in the input file, even though they are empty. And this defines a propagator. So the default propagator is um, hybrid propagation. Um, and the type of propagator is basically dependent on the type of wave function. So just specifying a wave function takes care of everything else. So this, this would be 90% of the calculations. I would say the entire point is that most of the decisions about what you're doing, what type of wave function, what type of integrals, pretty much everything that needs to be decided about auxiliary field has already been decided when you generate the this file. So the real decision making is going to be done at the second step when the conversion is done. And uh, Fionn is going to talk a little bit more about that. The second part of the input is the actual definition of the auxiliary field calculation, what I call the execution block. So it doesn't really matter the order because the code would parse, parse everything else and then it would go back and reread this execute, the execute blocks. But you need to specify a walker set, a Hamiltonian, a wave function, a propagator, and, and an information block. So everything that you define up there, you have to name it in such a way that you can specify here. For example, you can you can define three Hamiltonians, and whatever you define, whatever you pass here is the one that's actually going to be used for this particular accelerated field calculation. The parameters are pretty self-evident. You have time step. You have well, actually, no, I will take that back. So. Uh, I'll, I'll go back to the blocking, but you have time steps, you have number of walkers, and you define your estimators in here. If you don't define anything, it would only measure the energy. 
but you can define, for example, density matrices, or uh, you can specify energy. Uh, whatever, what it would do with energy, if you specify energy as an estimator, is that it can it can accept a different trial-weight function. So a typical thing that you might do is you might define two-way functions. You can use one-way function. Whatever you pass in here is going to be used only for propagation. The energy is actually not going to be evaluated on that wave function. The energy is going to be evaluated on whatever wave function you pass here if you actually define an energy uh, observable, estimator. So if you have a really expensive wave function, you know, 10 million determinants, you cannot evaluate the energy of something that big would be expensive. But you can do the propagation because you only need overlaps, which are far less expensive than energy. So one thing that you can do is you specify a very expensive wave function up here, and then only a moderately expensive wave function here. So the trick is that if you do that and you don't set the, the local energy approximation, which is not turned on unless you do it by hand, the energy would only be evaluated during estimation and it doesn't, it, it is not needed for propagation. And so I will go back to why that is important. The propagation scheme has a three inner, has a three loop structure closely following real space, the real space code. And this is actually some potential for optimization. What would happen is, so you go first, you have an outer loop of blocks, and inside blocks you have steps and sub-steps. Block essentially, you, inside the block loop essentially, you of course do a, a loop over steps and sub-steps, and once per block you evaluate your estimators. So if you have estimators that are expensive, like, like a density matrix or a really expensive energy for the wave function, a wave function for the energy, you can delay that evaluation an arbitrary number of steps. So you can decorrelate an arbitrary amount and only evaluate the energy every 100 or 200 steps. And basically what you do by that is that even if the energy might be very expensive, you reduce its weight by a factor of 100 or 500. So you, you essentially get to adjust how frequent you do this. So the main purpose of blocks is to make, to have control over, and the other thing that happens is that that's when we write out to disk properties. So things that are really slow, like writing to this and measuring observables, we only do once per block. Steps is, of course, inside blocks. And at this point, we do branching, load balancing, and orthogonalization. You get to control the frequency of orthogonalizations, but you don't get to control the frequency of branching. So at every step, you will branch and you will load balance. So we go to this every block. We go to the MPI network every step. Essentially, that's the way we're designing this. And inside soup steps, which you're going to do for every step you're going to do, in this case, four soup steps, you only propagate. So soup steps are for the correlation, steps are for network, and blocks are for essentially very slow things and, and disk I.O. So by, by having control over this, you can mitigate a lot of the overheads uh, in the calculation. Yeah, do you have an idea on how uh, sensitive total correlation you are compared to the DVD? It would be, so he's asking how sensitive to autocorrelation is. To first order identical. To first order identical. So if, if you do a similar calculation with DMC and you see how many steps you need to decorrelate to first order, it would be the same, very similar number. Yeah. Of course, it is very sensitive to, it's actually in projection time what matters. Because if you use a really small time step, that would elongate your autocorrelation time. And how about time step sensitivity? About time, time step sensitivity. So in practice, it is. Not a big deal in practice. We, I mean, this is a, a very, this is a typically small time step. We usually use 0.02 or something like that. Do you need to extrapolate that for molecular systems? Um, if you want the extrapolated number, yes, there will there will be sensitivity. I would say very similar to to real space. So to first order things are are similar. We don't have the non-local problem, and we don't have the essentially the T modes or any of these things. So so the extrapolation is usually much smoother. Well, there's going to be some magnitude and you're going to extrapolate. You have, you're going to have to do it. If the wave function is good, the one thing that we really see, and it's very dramatic, I don't have figures here, but we have a paper where it's just really dramatic. If you improve the wave function, that dramatically improves the time step convergence. So we're doing some hover calculations where we did a little bit of, a, we tried to put a gastro on the wave function, and we basically, the, the energy was better, we were happy, but when we look at the time step better, we could use 10 times the time step. At half, I mean, basically, we're still no, not noticing any time step error. So there is a little bit of a trade-off, and, and I would say unexplored territory that might lead to some some good results, some some good things. Yeah. 
So was that a slight divergence you mentioned between the real space and auxiliary field codes? In real space, you measure the observables every single step and accumulate them throughout a block and then write. So is it different? You're saying in FQC you only measure it once a block? Yeah, so he's, he's, talking, he's saying that in real space, in the real space code, you measure the observables at every step and you accumulate along the way. In this case, no, we do it only once per block. And the, the point is that if you want to do that, you just set steps and sub steps to one. And then you will be measuring every actual step. This just gives you the choice to do whatever you want. And in practice, we did it this way because some observables can be quite expensive. And so there's no need because of autocorrelation. You don't need an energy evaluation every step because your autocorrelation is maybe 100, right? So, so you get that freedom. But in practice, if you do nothing, the default for steps and sub steps is just one. So you can just set blocks and keep going. And I need to go faster. Of course. So, do I have time to do this? Um, I'm going to have to do this fairly quickly. So, the, the code has two ways of representing the, four elect the two electron integrals. This is that four body, four index quantity that it's a monster, and that essentially the entire efficiency and the entire code has to be kind of built around how you handle this. So, we have two choices. We have Cholesky factorization, which means that you're writing this IKJL as a contraction over two tensors that are third order. And this naturally gives you that uh, partitioning over N that I was talking before. Each one of these Ls for a particular N is a full two body operator, essentially. And you can rewrite this slightly into something that looks like the sum over squares. So by doing Cholesky factorization, which, which is a generic mathematical concept, you can think of this M as a matrix of basically of rows and columns of size M squared, and you would just fit that to layback and it would give you some Cholesky decomposition. Um, essentially, you can do it that way. And so you reduce the memory cost from being fourth order to being third order now. You, you now scale as M cubed. Um, Given this general framework, we have a sparse representation and a k-point representation. The sparse representation, of course, is, is, it's the only option right now for molecular problems. I have to be completely honest, we have put, we have been completely biased to solid state calculations. So for solids, the code is much more developed than for molecules. Um, the, this is the only choice for molecular problems, and essentially you store the Ls, and some version of this M is not exactly M, but some version of this M as a sparse matrix. So if you have symmetries in the system or if the basis functions are far, essentially if the magnitude of this quantity or that quantity falls below some threshold and you get to set the threshold when you do in the input file, you just drop that quantity and it's zero. If you don't store that number, so the, the storage cost essentially gets dropped by whatever sparsity fraction, by whatever sparsity factor you have. So for really sparse Hamiltonians, think about a Hover model. You can represent the Hover model like this and you would only have M of this m to the fourth power being on zero, you can do a Hover model where, where within this, this formulation. The, so it automatically has all the symmetries in the system, which is perfect, but we sacrifice the efficiency because we have to do sparse linear algebra, which is quite inefficient compared to this. So it's a little bit of a trade-off. Um, the real space representation, it, it only, uh, it's only for solids, and it's only on the complex field of the code because it needs essentially k points and, and complex values. Um, it's actually the, the suggested, and it's going to be the much more efficient way of running systems that have k points. Even a two by two by two would see quite a bit of a of a speed up compared to the sparse representation. But the bigger the k point grid is, the bigger the speed up you see. So with the k point representation, we can do four by four, five by five, six by six unit cells. And it's going to scale poorly with the size of the unit cell. So the difference between a one atom cell and a four atom cell is significant. But the smaller the unit cell, the much bigger you can go in k points. So you can do six by six by six of a one atom cell, or maybe four by four by four of a four atom, five atom cell. It's a little bit of a trade off, trade -off between the two. So this is optimized for really small unit cells with lots of k points. This is optimized for really, really, really for sparse Hamiltonians. And we have a formulation that is optimized for large unit cells that have, well, whether they're symmetries or not, essentially is irrelevant. So we have what's called the tensor hypercontraction, which I don't have a lot of time to formulate, but the central idea is that you rewrite your four electron index as some complicated contraction that only involves matrices. 
and the dimensions of this mu index is, is linear on the size of the basis. So the formal scaling of the storage for this is m squared. You only need essentially matrices, but the way that you need to use them is much more complicated. It's not a simple linear product anymore. You have to do this fairly complicated contraction over multiple indexes. But by twisting and turning and really looking at things in many different ways, you can still formulate this into a way that is fairly efficient. And the big benefit is that we don't rely on any symmetries here. So, so we still have m square scaling in memory and n cube mem uh, cost in computation. Uh, for it can be like a completely disordered unit cell with 100 atoms. And this, with this, we can do probably up to 130, 120, 130 atoms with current uh, machines. And uh, this is currently the limit. It's a, it's a slower. Uh, of course, you are not using the symmetries, so it's going to be slower. But it's currently the only way of doing systems where we don't use symmetries and you want to do more than 20 or 30 atoms, I would say. So if, if you want to do a large unit cell with 100 atoms, it would be quite impossible to do with that with these two approaches, a, a big disorder unit cell. Um, this is an example comparing Cholesky and THC from a recent paper uh, by our group. Uh, and essentially, you can show that it's a, it's a similar formulation. It's, there are convergence parameters, but if you converge them, you get the same answer. And so in one case, we're doing um, the sparse representation where you have, this is a three by three by three unit cell of carbon. Um, and this is the cold curve. And you can, in that case, there was a lot of symmetry. So that structure in the sparse case is quite sparse due to momentum conservation. On the THC case, in the THC case, it's just some unit cell with uh, 54 atoms. So essentially, um, the, the, the performance is, is quite competitive and you get the same answer regardless. And we get, you know, results that are quite spot on and compare very favorably with CCSD. I don't have that much time, so I'm going to start moving fast. Uh, this, I, I, I'm going to just say this. Basically, I have said everything that, that is encapsulated here. I guess you can think of this as, as for your own benefit, but the scaling, depending on the type of calculation that you want to do, you want to use different choices here. So if you have a large unit cell, you have to use THC. If you have a small unit cell with K points, you absolutely want to use the dense K point code. And if you have a, if you have a molecule or if you have something in between the two, where for some reason you actually have sparsity in the calculation, then you want to use the, the sparse code. Uh, in most cases right now, essentially, uh, the, the most efficient way by far is to use the K point code that's sparse, that's dense, sorry. We, have, we don't have a paper yet on this implementation. It is quite new, and um, I'm supposed to have written it six months ago, and for some reason I just keep doing other things. But anyway, soon, within the next month or so, we, we will have a full description of this. But we've had this for quite a number of months. We have a GPU implementation for it, and it is, it is fantastic. It really opens up what we can do for solid state calculations. Uh, the, only, the other decision, um, which might be more for the you know, when you have a little bit more experience and you're looking to try to improve your calculations is the choice of wave function. Um, deciding how much to say. So the code has a choice. When you input a wave function, it is always assumed to be multi-determinant. The only distinction is what is the relationship between each determinant in the expansion. The pH MSD, which you can define as the type in the wave function, assumes that orbitals, that the, the different determinants are orthogonal, and that actually one determinant is related to another by a certain set of excitations. So the typical input in this case would just be which orbitals in the orbital set are occupied for every determinant, the, the sort of the CI string, and you get a long list of those. You define what is your reference, and essentially you give the, the list of determinants, and you, and you define which one you want to take as the reference. And the code would take We'll do a full calculation on the reference, and every other determinant, it will do fast update schemes. So essentially calculate the appropriate quantity without having to recompute everything from scratch. So the cost grows as the rank of the excitation. If you have a system with a thousand atoms and you only do double excitations, then instead of something that would cost m cubed, would now cost m squared times two, rather than the full thousand cubed. So the speed up is amazing, um, but it's completely dependent on how fast the particle hole excitation actually improves the wave function. On the other hand, this is something that we have been working on quite extensively over the few years. We have a full implementation of non-orthogonal wave functions. We optimize where we can, but there is not that much room for optimization because to first order, we assume no relation whatsoever between different determinants. 
This gives you a lot of freedom. I mean, it leads to a really compact wave function. But the downside is that there is very little support for it on the quantum chemistry community. So we basically have um, codes that would do this that are not public and cannot be shared for now. They were written by Gustavo Scuseria. So eventually we would have drivers that would generate these wave functions inside QMC5. We're working on that, but that's still not ready. Um, Okay, I don't have a lot of time, but um, we did comparisons in silicon with, uh, this is again the same situation where we do a really tiny unit cell. This is the four atom unit cell of silicon in the diamond structure. We burn massive amounts of computing time to get the selected CI numbers converged, and then we compare against auxiliary fields with or without non orthogonal wave functions, so single determinant or, or multi determinants. And you can see that the first thing is that the error on the single determinant for silicon it's on the order of a millihardry over the entire range of the cold curve. And something like 20 determinants is enough to basically erase most of the atoms. So you get sub millihardry accuracy with a handful of determinants. You also have MP2 and CC, CC and CCSD results. On molecules, the, the convergence is also quite dramatic. You can see how much faster this is for. I didn't put what this was for. This is for NACL, a very simple example from one of our papers. It takes quite a while and quite a number of determinants, this is on a logarithmic scale, to start seeing improvement on the selected CI side. But if you do non orthogonal determinants, the improvement is, is quite dramatic and quite fast. So I, I don't have a lot of time, so I, I'm not going to go into too much detail. But you should look at the papers if you're interested or maybe talk to us. Um, the observables, which is the last thing, um, it's, they're very easy to set up. Uh, you would need to only add an estimator block requesting the observable. Right now we have mixed distribution or back propagation. Right now we only measure one RDMs, just to be uh, to be honest. We we have mixed the, the whole point in, in the near future as we start getting interested in more and more observables is you define what type of estimator you want, whether it's mixed distribution or back propagation, and then you would leave a list, you would give a list of the things that you want to calculate within the back propagated states or the mixed distributes uh, or the mixed den uh, the density states. Uh, so right now we would just calculate the 1RDM, but eventually there will be a choice. And the whole point is that most of the work is in the case of back propagation, for example, is actually generating the state. Once you have the, le the left hand side state, you can stick anything in the middle. And so you would just define what you want in there. Right now it's just the 1RDM. We're looking at things like, and it's the static 1RDM. Uh, so Fion, for example, is working on getting the dynamic one RDM so that we can do frequency dependence and also on doing contraction. So calculating the two RDM is very expensive, but if you give me a matrix that you want to contract against, we can do the contraction over a two RDM, and that is something that we can do without having the, the memory cost of storing and averaging a two RDM. Um, there's a little bit of a, I'm gonna leave this here. Um, if you want to know, there's quite a bit of work because as I said, the effort is on big calculations. So we want to go way beyond what we can do with the, in terms of memory with a single node. So there is a lot of infrastructure in the code to allow you to distribute the two electron integrals over an arbitrary number of nodes, basically so that you can fit them. And you can go to integral sizes that are way beyond what you can do with a single node. In the GPU, this is particularly crucial, right? A node right now typically has 100 gigabytes or more. The GPU only has 16, so we went through great lengths to, to be able to optimize this in such a way that you can go way beyond the 16 gigabyte limit of a GPU. Um, so there are several tags that you have to set up if you want to actually turn on that distribution. There is some penalty for communication, of course. Communication is not free, particularly if IBM is involved. But um, <laughs> the not to go that far, and it's actually not that inefficient. It's just factor of two. Okay. But, and then there is a question of, you can actually propagate walkers in parallel. So you can throw an arbitrary, you can throw an entire node that propagate in a single walker if you want. So you can thread the line between um, any ratio of walker to node, of walker to cores, uh, essentially within a GPU. This was mainly designed for large multi-cores and DOE took a right turn on GPU land. So this is still somewhat relevant for, but you know, with GPUs this is, this is mainly not that important anymore. And finally, the last slide, uh, there is a GPU port. Currently, it's only for the K-point code, only for the representation of the Hamiltonian 
that is explicitly for K-Coins, and it's mainly because it clearly shows our interest. That's what we want to do right now. But we are working slowly through the rest of the code, and within the next three to six months, we're going to have a full board of all Hamiltonian types. And the typical speedups, we're in love with GPUs. I mean, as far as we go, don't ever build CPUs anymore. We don't care. I mean, we only want GPUs. The speed up is huge. It's compare. So we have pretty good CPUs in Livermore. Comparing the best CPU that we have with uh, with Summit, it's easily a 10 to 40x. And somewhat dependent on system size, of course. The bigger the system, the more work the GPU has, so the more it gets to show its muscles. But if you if you do 100 atom calculations, you are going to get a speed up somewhere between 25 and 40. It turns out that, so we do single precision, which is the recommended way to build the code if you want to do GPUs, mostly for the memory. The speed up that we get by doing single precision is more on the 20 to 30 percent, whereas the GP, the CPU is seeing a real 50 percent speed up. So that's why you go from 40x to only 25x when you turn on single precision. Essentially, the, that's a big benefit for the CPU, for the GPU is, is not so much. We can talk about what why that is. I mean, it's not trivial. It's, it's mainly why what we decide to do at single position and what we don't. But um, in any case, you're still gonna easily see a 20 to 25x if you do something large enough. And it's mainly the only way we can run. So we can run 100 atom calculations with a turnaround of four or five hours in summit. It will take us, you know, days of resubmitting on a CPU to to get the same quality of work. So can I ask? So, so uh, GPUs are not all the same. So, uh, so, so, so one one question. There's a, several questions here. So one is like, what about uh, backward compatibility with older GPUs? Or that's a very or, good or, question. Or, and or so, secondly, let me ask the uh, other questions at yeah. once. Sorry. And then, um, you know, also uh, obviously there's different brands of GPUs and so forth. So, so first question was about. Each of the GPUs, second question was about the, the, the brand. Um, we have been very focused on Pascal and beyond. The code should compile pre Pascal. So SM6 and above will be nicely optimized. SM3.5 to 6, there are some slow pieces that I mainly decided not to optimize because I didn't think that we would actually use it. And it doesn't compile pre 3.5. So if you're really, really interested in using anything that's between three and a half and six, there is one native GPU routine that doesn't exist. Who's, I have a very poor implementation of it that is really slow. So if, if you're really interested, I, I, I would find a way to make that efficient. It has to do with collective access of shared memory between different uh, SMs. But the short answer is Pascal and Volta in NVIDIA land, it's nicely optimized. Anything beyond before that, I would say I haven't really looked at it, and I would assume that it's somewhat slower. Regarding uh, brands, this is quite important in our Exascale project. So we are not completely uh, architecture independent, but within a few months we will be. So like I said, most of our work is, is laid back and blast, and we get to get that we have paths of getting that for essentially architecture independent and the little bit of work that is not architecture independent alfredo who's somewhere in here is basically making that architecture independent so as soon as he he gets done we should have a essentially a, a generic architecture independent code which for us is quite important because amd gpus are coming they we have a, a machine in livermore right now so so it's really important to be able to to get that so Anyways, this is only FMC by the way. Real space asks somebody else because I don't know. <laughs> and so finally, this is what's coming. Uh, we have a long and amb ambitious list, and these things are to some degree being worked on. And so finite temperature algorithms have gotten really popular recently. We have been planning to do this for quite a while. We were beat by every single person doing this. Everybody published way before us, so it's okay. We're going for speed and supremacy. We're not going for version. <laughs> So um, the final temperature algorithm is being worked on. We have a prototype. It's mainly a matter of piping and, and finishing the code. Uh, we have the full GPU coverage. I'm going to say this is somewhat dependent on whether we actually want to run something that's not a K-point calculation. So if somebody really, really wants to do a big molecule, that, that might help us get the motivation to wrap this up sooner than later. Pinot decoupling is a nonlinear non magnetism has to be done in six months because 
it has to be done in six months, so it will come. Forces, uh, again, forces is one of those things that if people want them and, they, and we really hear it, we will put priority in it, but for now it doesn't seem like our top priority. But, but we know that it's something that we're going to have to fight with very soon. There's a BASP interface that's on the works, and the turns out that you can actually use the same trick that we use to speed up the Cholesky code with k points. You can also do it in PHC. So we're quite happy with the Cholesky k point code. So we might not get to do this right away, but but this would actually be quite impressive because it would be linear cost in memory as, as a, in, in the limit of a large system. So we will get to that at some point. 